Hi, I'm Sue Mae Thompson, and I'm CEO of the Women's Foundation. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you to today's breakfast panel for aspiring women directors. We're here at the American Club, which unlike the Hong Kong Club down the road, has always welcomed female members. <laughs> By way of background, the Women's Foundation is one of Hong Kong's leading NGOs dedicated to the advancement of women through groundbreaking research, innovative and impactful community programs and education and advocacy. And a key focus for us is ensuring that Hong Kong's highly educated and talented women can achieve your full potential. Now there's obviously an element of social justice about this, that women should have equal access to opportunities. But this is also very much about competitiveness for business, and the economy, better business performance, and better corporate governance. Warren Buffett has famously said that the only reason he made it in life is that for much of his life, he only had to compete with half the population. At the Women's Foundation, we believe Hong Kong needs to keep up with global trends, where greater awareness about the benefits of having more diversity at the leadership level is driving organizational change and increased female representation on boards and on senior executive teams. In some countries, governments have stepped in or are considering stepping in to accelerate that pace of change by introducing legislation mandating that public companies must have a certain percentage of female directors. What lessons can we in Hong Kong learn from abroad? What is the economic cost to Hong Kong of not having more women directors and what's the right approach for Hong Kong to ensure that more women are getting to the top? It's because we wanted to encourage informed discussion and debate on these issues with all relevant stakeholders that we decided to launch Women on Boards Week. And this event uh, is a key part of Women on Boards Week. And we decided very early on to reach out to partners like Standard Chartered and Community Business to help us achieve our vision, given the research that they pioneered in 2009 on women on the boards of the Hang Seng Index listed companies. Now that research showed um, that the uh, number of women on Hang Seng Index listed companies boards was 8.9%. Three years later, fast forward to Monday of this week, they launched an update to that research. Can anyone guess where that number is? 9%. Oh, you've read the research, obviously. <laughs> okay, so we see stagnation. Yesterday morning, the Women's Foundation held a chairman's breakfast where we engaged chairmen of Hong Kong's leading companies, well, kind of challenged them, really, about the lack of women on boards. And last night, we held a CEO dinner where we discussed attitudes to women and leadership, particularly among the family-held um, companies that are you know, so dominant in Hong Kong. That, if you like, is about the demand side for women directors. We wanted to see what is the demand. This morning is about all of you. You're the supply side. And we've gathered a distinguished panel of experts who will hopefully demystify the board appointment process for you and inspire you to pursue a board position. Our hope is that through events like this, the next time the research is done, the numbers will have moved significantly. Please help us make that hope a reality. Without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Robin Meredith of Bloomberg, who will moderate today's session. Thank you very much for coming. Good morning, everyone. Welcome. It is my great pleasure today to be moderating this panel on women and boards. Um, 
the goal for this panel is to really demystify the process. What does it take to get on a board? What do you need to know to accomplish that? Particularly for women seeking board appointments in Hong Kong, but also globally. We're gonna be asking questions like, what is the benefit exactly of serving on a board to you and to the company? What's the demand for female board members? And how do you position yourself properly for a board role, whether it's now, five years from now, or 10 years from now? We have a great lineup of executive search firm professionals and a chairperson herself, Catherine Jang from Standard Chartered Bank. Catherine's gonna give you some brief welcoming remarks in a moment. Then I'll kick off discussion by posing questions to the members of this panel. And then we'll open the floor to Q&A. And to me, that's the most important part of this morning because your, your questions will get at the heart of what all of you are here to say and prompt the most interesting discussion. So please be ready with your questions a few minutes from now after you've had a moment to finish breakfast and hear from the panelists. Let me just briefly introduce the panel. We've got two Catherines and we've got two token <laughs> men. Um, uh, first, Catherine Zhu is a consultant in Egon Gender International prior to joining EZI, where she handles board positions for IT and other sectors. Catherine spent 15 years at leading companies Motorola, Nortel, Pepsi, and EDS. So she's got a wealth of experience, both on the operational side and on the placing people's side. Next up, one of our token men, Robbie Knight, regional practice manager and CEO of the board practice at Hydric and Struggles. And prior to joining Hydric, Robbie, Robbie was the chairman and non-executive director of four Asian boards and uh, with Aviva, Britain's largest insurance group. We've also got Gene Chen, Vice Chairman and Managing Partner at Options Group. He brings a wealth of experience from the financial sector primarily, where his clients include all the leading players in private equity, asset management, corporate finance, and iBanking. And last but certainly not least, we have Catherine Zhang, Chairperson for Greater China at Standard Chartered Bank. Um, I just met earlier this week, and I know some of you did as well with Mervyn Davies, who has been a real pioneer from Stand Chart in the entire issue of women on boards uh, in the UK, certainly, as well as in Asia. And it's very nice to see the bank continuing to support this effort. Um, Catherine has held a number of executive positions. She chairs the boards of three Standard Charter Bank subsidiaries, and she serves on the board of The Gap, Sotheby's and Baoshan Iron and Steel, so quite a diverse uh, uh, gathering. Catherine, uh, you are walking the walk. Will you please make a few remarks? Good morning. Good morning. The moment I walk into the room, I thought it's very nice. It's a very warm and cozy room. Friday morning, early riser, and uh, bright and cheerful faces. It's, it's great to be here. Uh, so, ladies and um, the few uh, men <laughs> whose presence are very precious uh, because they help to make us look special. So, I've heard that the um, uh, subscription to this panel was quite overwhelming, and which is fantastic. Because what it means is this concern, this, uh, this interest in the topic, which is very close to my heart. Um, yes, in Standard Chartered, uh, we, we're very proud to be able to sponsor meaningful events and meaningful um, research, like the report that uh, Sue may have just mentioned. And, and, and oh, this report, we, we've heard that somehow show stagnation in terms of the improvement of women on board, the particip participation rate of women on board. This is uh, a subject that is just like having women in um, uh, executive function. Actually, it's a long fight, isn't it? You know, in the 60s, we talk about equality of women, equality of pay. We talk about 
just women in the workforce to start off with. Then later on, we talk about women in senior management position. And now we talk about women on board. So actually, there's progress, which is not bad. The issue with Hong Kong, all of a sudden, that we have this interest, which is also a reflection, I thought, on the sophistication of Hong Kong as a business and financial center. There's this expectation of this little place. And why is that this expectation? Because our, our business world is really having um, professionals of the quality at par with any key centers of the world. So if that's the case, then how is a stack up of our women's participation in, um, in boards? So we started off with this uh, Hang Seng Index, 48 companies. And um, of course, the, um, the result is not as good as we thought. But then, you know, with all these outstanding ladies in the room, I, I, I'm very optimistic that the, um, the rate will change very soon. But we need to work together, both on the supply side, as somebody said, as well as on the demand side. In Senate Chartered, diversity and inclusion is is certainly is, is the center of what we do. It's a distinctive element of our brand. Now, we actually just very pragmatic. We're an old bank, 150 something years, uh, depending on where you are in Hong Kong is, uh, I think is 152 years. With this long history and operating in very fast changing markets, we, you know, we are in Asia, we're in South Asia, we're in Middle East, and we're in Africa, where the GDP growth is among the highest in the world. We need to continue to rejuvenate ourselves. And the rejuvenation process, one key element is through diversity and inclusion. We need to reflect somehow through our workforce, the client profile, as well as the diversity of the markets that we operate in. So if you see, look at our workforce, we have 87,000 people. We have 132 nationalities within 132. And half of them are women. In Hong Kong, I'll share with you, we have 56% women in our workforce, 35% in senior management, and one third of our board is women. Now there is still some way to go in search of balance, and this is what we're committed to do. But we are very proud of this um, achievement so far, <coughs> because uh, I said about I, I talked about you know other than the nicety of gender equality. Basically, we see having women in senior management, having women on boards, give us better depth as well as breadth of perspectives of the market, as well as decision making. Now, hopefully, we, we believe and that somehow is reflected in our financial performance. Now, time to do a little bit of promo. We just did our result announcement. We are into our ninth year of record income and record profit. And we believe that's partly reflecting our continuous effort in having, in seeking balance in gender equality. I know I'm in the company of um, most outstanding women professionals, and of course, male professionals. And um, you have, you either sit on board or have the qualification and aspiration to sit on boards. I, 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 I have a few, um, uh, I'll share with you more later on in our uh, discussion. But a few questions that I would very much like to park with you and that you might like to raise questions later on in our discussion. One is, I think you know, we, we will talk about it and we all know women have, um, we, 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 we tend to be much more self-limiting, much more humble than, than what we deserve, what, what our qualification, what our achievements deserve. But then still, there's this question about how prepared are you for boards? The preparation is in multiple faxes, multiple faxes. One is 
not, not just qualification, that's not the case, but it's just that. Uh, what do you want to get out of boards? What's, what's that? What, what's that board um, uh, membership brings you? And, um, a, and the other way is that, what do you bring to that table? We all have our strengths, you know. Bear in mind, this is something that people will ask you, then you ask yourself, what do you bring to the table? And the second is that finding the right boards. Sexy name matters, size matters, or is, the, or is it the industry, the company's governance, or the chairman that matters? So think about that. And then if you, we have um, the presence, our panelists is some of the best, is, is most uh, uh, representative of the search funds uh, for, for um, boards. If you go for a, a chat with them, how do you present yourself? Is it the same that you would do with any job interview? And um, the other thing is that, we, we always, uh, the considerate group, we have a lot of things that we need to juggle with in life. So in the scheme of things, if you were to prioritize how important it is actually to sit on a board. I know it is sort of like an anticlimax, but it is an important question. So without further ado, I would like to pass it back to uh, Robin to start off the day of the discussion. Thank you. Catherine, thank you so much. What we're going to do today is um, talk first about demand. That is, how do companies want women on boards? If so, how many? And then later we're going to talk about supply. That's you guys. Mm. You're the future supply for the companies who want women on boards. So um, let me start <coughs> with, with uh, Catherine, if I may, uh, talking about the demand. You said that there's a positive landscape out there for women mm -hmm. with board potential. Just tell us a little bit more about that and, and what kind of companies specifically are looking for women to join their boards. Sure. Um, hi, everyone. It's a great honor to be here with you. Um, I very much echo Catherine's opening remarks. We believe that Diversity, um, board um, diversity. To Robin's board. question, I have seen very strong uh, increasing demand, particularly from North American and the European firms, for Asian and even better Asian female board members. So for the last 12 months, uh, almost on a weekly basis, I would receive calls from our colleagues uh, in London, uh, in Germany, uh, in France, and in North America, for us to recommend strong Asian female candidates. If I look at the statistics, the statistics of the female uh, board hires our firm has made in the last three years, the percentage of Asian female board hires um, and towards the total pool of female hires we have made has grown from 13% in, uh, in 2009 to 34% in 2011. So out of the total pool of uh, female board candidates, Asian pool now has become the biggest. There are a number of reasons contribute to that demand, and I will come to which companies are hiring. I think number one, there's a genuine desire on the company parts, uh, particularly in North America and in Europe, to, uh, to have that composition of, um, of diversity on their boards. Number two, I think Asia has become the growth engine for most of the multinational clients. So by having Asian board member and female board member, the companies have better access to the local market and customer insight, better understanding of the regulatory framework, and better ability to attract talent, the local talent or female talent. So the third reason probably is because um, a lot of countries are now signing up to the voluntary gender mixed targets in Europe and in Australia. And uh, what we are seeing is companies are doing preempt actions to attract best, uh, the best diversity candidates while they are still available. So as a result of that, we have seen the demand across different industry sectors 
although I think diversity uh, is defined differently in different countries and by different industries. So the consumer-related companies traditionally have more female board members um, to start with. Now they're looking for female board members with digital experience, for example. But in even more traditional um, industry per se, like oil and gas or industrial companies, we have seen increasing demand for female uh, board members. So it is across the board. Great. So it sounds like we're seeing more demand in U.S. and Europe. So, mm -hmm. um, Robbie, I, I would like you to address um, Australia, which requ the ASX requires listed companies to, to disclose um, the number of women they have on their boards. I'm wondering if that effort, like the European quota discussion, is helping, and you know, do you have to leave town to get on a board if you're from Hong Kong? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, yeah. Um, we are placing a lot of women on Australian boards, and I have to say, I think probably Australia is one of the countries that we class under Asia within our territory that is, uh, is, in, is dramatically increasing its number of uh, women board members. And there, there are also one or two extremely talented women chairmen in um, Australia. Um, one I spoke to recently, Catherine Livingston, she's the chairman of Telstra, $25 billion company, and extremely effective uh, uh, chair chairman. And she sits on other boards in industrial companies, um, such as Worley Parsons, which is unusual to see uh, women on industrial natural resources type of boards, because uh, as, as Catherine said, uh, most women tend to be in uh, consumer-related boards at the moment. Um, I feel that uh, geography plays you know, such a big role still in, our, in, in, in my practice. Um, unfortunately, we are not seeing a large demand for women on boards in Hong Kong, Singapore, China. Um, most of the demand is coming, as Catherine said, from uh, Europe, North America, and Australia. And the demand there is for Asians, and women, and uh, a lot of chairmen in, in North America particularly are killing two birds with one stone by saying we'll have Asian <laughs> women. Uh, so uh, there is definitely a dearth of um, talent, Asian uh, women, right now, and I think that uh, our numbers match almost entirely. Um, Catherine's here with Egon Zendra in terms of number of hires and the increase in number of hires. What I'm finding here, it's quite, it's, it, it's, you have to encourage chairmen to consider women. And, and I'm finding myself doing that. And whereas before, just to, uh, when I started looking at uh, women on boards last year, I found it quite difficult to encourage chairmen to, look, to specifically look at women and identify women. I'm finding it much easier now. And I think that's a good first step in Asia. And hopefully we're gonna see then that increase to a, 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 a genuine demand. Well, Catherine and Robbie are, are more traditional headhunters for all kinds of companies, but I want to turn to Gene because he does mostly finance industry and particularly private equity and corporate finance. So the dynamic's a little different because you've got companies that all of a sudden raise money and boom, they need a board. So they're in a rush. Is that good or bad for the prospect of women going on boards? I mean, how much emphasis is put on diversity for your clients? Sure. Well, first of all, I'm delighted to be here, even as a token male. Um, and I'm also delighted to see the youthfulness in this room, because I think in many ways it reflects the changing composition of board membership, especially with regard to the types of firms that we deal with, both pre- and post-IPO companies. These are all firms that are driven by change, they are driven by change in compositions of management and in the way they think. And I think that oftentimes, at least on the boards that I've been on, uh, cultural as well as gender diversity brings a whole new dynamic into the boardroom. And that is a catalyst of change. And so oftentimes, we have the unique luxury of dealing with non-traditional HSI type firms to inject into the way of thinking and the traditional way of thinking of many of these pre and post IPO companies, the need for diversity in the management structure and diversity in the boardroom. 
Now, with regard to greater China, we've been facing something that we faced in the United States in the 90s and even in the early 2000s, which is the proliferation of highly, highly talented, well-educated, and experienced women that at the period in time that they would be considered for board membership are faced with the ultimate challenge of being the super mom, the super spouse, and the super career person and the whole tiger mom syndrome in China is very much alive and well and has proliferated throughout Asia, where we will literally interview women who are talented, qualified for board membership, and yet have children of school age, especially boarding school or uh, early college education age that will sit with you and say, that's no problem, I'm moving with my child. Well, you're going to give up your career to move with your child, and they will say, yes, he or she is my number one priority. I will sacrifice everything I have for this child, especially in the mainland Chinese environment of the single child. And uh, it has been a very, very evident issue that we're faced with. So it's not as much convincing boards and management groups of the talents of women and others to come into the boardroom. It's challenging the women to make that decision of an added life commitment to their already overworked schedule. Interesting, very interesting. So a third of the Hang Seng Index here in Hong Kong, um, a third of the listed companies have no women on their boards at all. And I'd really like to hear from Catherine, who is, you know, has chaired and sat on a number of prestigious boards. In your view, in practice, does it really make a difference to companies to have women and diversity on their boards? Or, in, you know, and are there any risks that companies that don't have diversity, like those third of the Hang Seng Index, you know, face because they don't? Thank you. Um, I, 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 I couldn't understand, I mean, this, uh, this uh, phenomenon, actually. Because Hong Kong is known to a place where people are very smart, companies are uh, you know, really always thinking ahead and um, a, a efficiency, pragmatism. If you look at Hong Kong, our annual consumer spend is 52 billion US dollar. On average, it is 43 billion Hong Kong dollar a month consumer spend. And we have more women than men in the population, period. And if you look at that, and if you think you know, your board that is just one sex <coughs> and determining everything that is catering largely for the opposite sex, the logic just doesn't gel. So I, I think it's just time. I think it's, it's, it's not out of a conscious decision. I think it's just a, 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 a process an evolution, I think, for boardrooms that very soon I think they will catch up with this. I, I'm quite optimistic about this uh, because I, I'm a Hong Kong person. I know how pragmatic we are. So then there is, it's just important that you have that uh, a comprehensive perspective of the market, of your consumer mindset reflected in the boardroom. So that's, that's one. And then I hope also that answer the risks if not having women on board. Now, a, a little bit of sharing of personal experience is that when I went on to uh, get board, um, a, an American company, and uh, interesting, I was the, 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 the only woman when I was in the, uh, when I joined. Now we have another lady joining. And as uh, I must say, it was quite daunting in the first uh, meeting, actually, it was the first gathering. They were looking at me to sort of like, um, so, you know, new kid, new kid on the block, as well as the first woman in this room. So uh, what do you bring to the table? So this is uh, a, a, but is a very good, uh, is a very good occasion and uh, some, something that I prepared for. But they, it's, you, you just have to be, pre be prepared lady said there is this 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 uh, you say art or you say it's awkward you, you you have to pass through it the only way to do it is as I said is um, to be you know, not self-limiting just think you are as any men 
we say when men go on to a job interview, first thing is that they think the attraction, they think of the attraction of the role. What is that to bring to them? And that excitement, that interest will bring somehow, bring the best of you, bring the, <laughs> bring the very optimistic, the, 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 the favorable, favorable side of you. So I think it is uh, quite important that uh, we will always bear that in mind. And um, so is uh, some, some of the tidbits of, um, of, of, um, of my experience of being the first, being the only woman in a men's boardroom. Interesting. But what about Jean's point? Jean was saying that we women, we all know we work harder than men, no offense to the token men here, but um, that we also generally, many of us have a responsibilities beyond just career. And that sometimes women rationally make the choice, well actually I'm gonna put one aspect of my life ahead of another. Um, Catherine, talk about why you actually serve on boards. Why should women want to? What's great about it, being on a board? It's um, why women wants it. I think it's the same why why men wants it. <laughs> it's the same in a sense that Robin, the sitting on board is a, it brings a lot of um, things that uh, uh, you wouldn't have expected when you were just a an executive in uh, uh, a company. One thing is you get to participate in uh, strategy. Um, uh, determination at the highest level you've got to have you, you you've got to see some of those uh, best brains that are representing the senior management of the companies that you serve on you've got to um, get you, you, you you've got to uh, have the information the kind of deliberation on subjects usually is another industry Right, when you serve on board is a different industry of something that you, 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 you otherwise would not have access to. And, um, and also the kind of responsibility on you as a board member to participate, to make those decisions is, is, is quite different from just being an executive. Um, because you don't have the operation, in a way you don't have your operational responsibilities and yet you know what it will mean for a decision that you make. It's just uh, fantastic. I mean, th those experiences are very, are very attractive indeed. Uh, how, just briefly, how do you select? You must have to be very careful about which boards you sit on because you've only got 24 hours in a day. Briefly, how do you do that? How did you prioritize it? I, I think it's a very crucial question and one that I would um, urge all of us to, to think about it. Uh, good news, I say for now, and didn't, uh, didn't um, uh, say it in, I, in um, the opening address, is that now we've heard all these demands um, of ladies, and actually a lot of demand on ladies who have Asian experience, and particularly China experience. Now, on the Americans, the uh, European boards, they all, the, the companies all have interest to break into the China market, or they are already there. But the problem is they don't necessarily have the kind of, the kind of um, insights, perspectives of Asia, of China, the way that an Asian, or the way that a person who have worked in this market has. So, and the other thing is that if they want to have um, China expertise, it's not necessarily that easy for them to find a Chinese, mainland Chinese ladies. Of course, there are more and more now, but then who have mainland Chinese ladies who are conversant with the cultures and the markets like a Hong Kong person would do. We, you know, no matter what ethnicity, we in Hong Kong, we have that, we have that versatility. So we, have, we are in a very attractive place. So the thing is, is for you, the question is really for you to choose. It's not necessarily that, wow, how do I find it? It's for you to choose what sort of board you want to sit on, which is back to the question that Robin raises. Is, um, I think is, uh, it has to be somehow that appeals to you. Like for me personally, I, um, uh, I sit on a steel company, 
a fashion company and an, 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 an auction, more art uh, company. The, I love fashion, I love art, and, um, and for steel, it somehow is something very important to China, something that I really want to learn. So somehow you need to, you need to uh, 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 analyze it. I, I would urge you to analyze it rather than just to go for sexy names. Very interesting, very interesting mix. All right, um, we've talked about the demand out there for women on board, and we've heard some pretty optimistic words from the headhunters on the panel, but I wanna talk about supply and get down to the really crucial question of when you guys are looking to f fill board seats, exactly what do you need to see on someone's resume? What are the people in this room, what experience do they need to have to be looked at seriously as board candidate. Catherine, how about you take that on first? Um, <clears throat> sure. Um, so I think there's a more traditional view of what an ideal female candidate would look like. This will be a global or regional CEO with a sizable and a, a reputable company. So wait, uh, first you have to be CEO of your company I'm to be considered profile. for the board seat, yes. okay. Um, and someone um, understands the, the local market someone who had government relations, um, and on top of all that, uh, who speaks fluent English, and can travel four to 12 times uh, a year to attend board meetings. If we consider that as the ideal profile, uh, the pool is very small, and that's why you probably understand <laughs> why Catherine is sitting on multiple boards. Um, so, so that's sort of more the traditional view. Um, I think we now working with the clients to, to very proactively look beyond that traditional mainstream CEO profile and focus more on competencies. What I mean by that is what really matters in a board seat. What will make one effective to contribute at the board level? So we look at people's resume based on uh, four main competencies. Strategy, result, collaboration, and independence, which is very critical as a non-executive director. So if we look at that, the pool of candidates is a lot bigger. So, um, and, and also I think it leads to a very different um, type of areas we will be looking for, um, which I think will probably relate to a lot of, a lot of you. Uh, we, we, we find the CVs coming from professional services firms, from audit, to banking, to a law firm, to strategy consultant, is very relevant. Um, particularly those who are in a management position. Um, they can relate to the challenge facing the board. We also find people, we encourage the clients to look at the level below the CEOs. They could be the function heads, the CMOs, uh, chief legal, chief HR. They now become very viable candidates for the board. So it, and, and I think the third area um, has become uh, interesting recently is people who serve on NGOs and in public sectors. So there is no one CV uh, size fits all. We look at competencies, we look at the relevant experience. Interesting, all right. Um, Robbie, you mentioned earlier to me that you get about a dozen CVs a week from women looking for board seats, and by the way, I hope that all three of our headhunters will get approximately 150 <laughs> resumes later this week. Um, but Robbie, if you, if you look out at this room, at this you know sort of cohort of, of people here, people who want to be on a board one day, what do they need to do now to build their CVs gradually so that eventually they'll meet that standard that you're looking for, that your clients are looking for? That's, uh, it's very exciting looking out here actually and seeing so many um, women who are keen to serve on boards and I assume that everybody in this room is keen to serve on a board at some time in the future. Um, before I sort of say how the steps go, I think probably I, I was very interested to hear what Catherine uh, said about you know, why, why do you want to serve on a board and I think it's, it's a very important thing before, rather than just saying I want to serve on the board, I think it is very important just to do a self-analysis and say why do I want to serve on the board? Why do I want to be there? And I thought Catherine's point about um, having this sort of con uh, this, 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 this connectivity with, um, w w with, a, with a very, very high quality executives and, uh, and very experienced uh, directors is, is, is a very compelling uh, story. Um, 
for me personally, serving on a board was, um, was life-changing in many ways because coming from being a CEO where you're sort of running things on a day-to-day -day basis and then suddenly going to this helicopter overview um, where your instinct is to rush in and grab, grab everything like you had been doing over the, over the past years when you're an executive and suddenly to become a non-executive and to, say, to, to be able to stand back and look and suddenly you realize just how much experience uh, you have and just how much you've got to give by not diving in and rolling your sleeves up and getting on with the job. So I think that um, uh, it, it would be great if we could all serve on boards before we became CEOs because we've been an awful lot better at being CEOs, I think. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's not going to happen. So, but I do think you, do, you need to look and say, what do I want to, do I really want to be on a board and why do I want to be on the board? I think, and Catherine articulated very well, so good reasons. Um, you have to serve apprenticeships, really, to go on boards. Um, you don't get straight onto a large listed board um, of, a, of a major uh, FTSE 100 or um, even, even a HSI company to start with. It's very unusual. I'm not saying you don't, but it's very unusual. And what I would suggest is that it's important to start serving on smaller boards, school boards, college boards. NGOs are very good as well. And this way, once, once we see on a CV that somebody is doing well in their career and they have taken some time out of their career to go and serve on boards and they start to understand the governance process and what it's all about, that's a very, very good first step. So when I see a CV that somebody is keen to serve on a board and they've already done work on any sort of board before, it's a great help. It's much easier to convince a chairman that this is the right person to take on. Um, the other good thing about NGOs, and I, I, I would stress NGOs are probably a really great first start. NGOs often have very, very high-powered, well-connected business people on the boards who are trying to give back to society and to the community. And you can often find yourself on, on a board of a charity which has got some extremely high-powered people um, who are very useful to connect with, who can then start that sort of introductory process where you get the networking at board level. Um, so, and, and you see the same thing with colleges, universities, and schools as well. It's the same sort of thing. People trying to give back to the community having reached the peak of their careers. And these, these people, when you sit on the board with them, they will give you a great deal of connectivity um, to move out. So I think probably um, my, when I see CVs and I see them coming in, I like to see a, de a desire to be on boards, um, but the right desire. Um, I like to see people who have made an effort to try and get onto boards, albeit, albeit, albeit they small, um, schools, as I say, NGOs. And uh, I think that um, professional qualifications help an enormous amount because there's absolutely no doubt that all boards have to have some form of accounting. Um, most boards need some form of legal expertise. And uh, if you do have a professional qualification, it's going to help a great deal. I want to go back to that theme of networking, Robbie, that you brought up and ask Jean, what kind of, how, how, do, how do people, board candidates, get on the radar screen, people like you and for companies? How specifically, what kind of networking would help them? <clears throat> well, as we talk across the previous three comments, as far as passion, as far as independent thinking, and as far as taking small steps in order to achieve the, the major uh, moves that ultimately bump you from 8.9% to 9% uh, membership over a three-year period, which is rather extensive, uh, I think it's important to, to say that when most of us do our searches, we do our searches through what we call warm calls. And we do our sourcing by contacting people that do have those circles of influence that have served on boards that may be NGOs, they may be uh, schools and alumni associations, which are tremendous spheres of influence for people to meet people, people of influence, but also people who will observe that independent thinking, people who will observe that passion, and people will, who will observe that contribution that you can and will make in the boardroom. So when you look at the average statistics right now, I think the numbers are the, the average female director is around 59 years old and male director is probably slightly older, that if, especially in this room where all of you are young, you've got to look at the smaller steps that you need to take to achieve the larger goals that are ultimately attainable. But still, at 9%, 
it's still a tough road to hoe. So ultimately, look and mine down into charitable organizations, look and mine down into school and alumni associations and the NGOs. These are the places where not only for you, it's a great practice ground, but it's also a way for you to make a name for yourself in order to be considered for those higher and hopefully more attainable positions. I want to take some questions now from the audience, but I first want to share something that we were talking about in the back room that I found really surprising. And that was that all of you on the search side of things said, look, you know, actually companies really, really want to hire women directors. I said, really? Well, why don't they? You know, that's strange. But your point was that, that they do. Much, which is not the not what we all think of. And the other thing that I heard of is that actually there are a lot of women who are qualified who don't themselves in their hearts necessarily accept that or know that. And so I think that that is a really important lesson. Any woman who's um, been in the workforce will know that most men are far more confident about their abilities even when they have fewer abilities than you. <laughs> That's a very good point. <laughs> no, nothing personal. <laughs> but, but my point is that, that we are often more qualified than we give ourselves credit for being. That's what I heard from the objective folks who are looking at all those resumes. And that I found actually very encouraging. It's not that the women aren't qualified for boards. It's that the qualified women aren't necessarily putting themselves out there. Actually, Robin, could I, could I make a point? Because we, we were spoke about this uh, in the back room. Actually, we, we offer a service um, of board effectiveness and board evaluation. So we do quite a lot of work in seeing how effective boards are. And one of the most interesting facts is, is that when we go and speak to chairman and say, you know, we'd like to do a board effectiveness or board evaluation, the chairman are often quite keen to do it. But when he puts it to the board members, all the women say, yes, 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 we must do that. And all the men say, no, we don't want to do that. And invariably, it's because the women are overqualified. They feel they've had to become overqualified to get onto these boards. And an awful lot of the men are not very well qualified, and they've got there through relationships or whatever. And it, 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 we see it frequently where, where the men do not want to be evaluated, and the women are very happy to be evaluated. Yeah, this kind of old boys network is what we're all sort of struggling with. Mm. Right, uh, questions from the audience, please. Sir. Hi, Hayden from UBS. Um, I brought a few colleagues with me today who advise on IPOs and board structuring. What do they, what should they say to the chairman to convince them to look at women on boards? All right, Jean, would you like to take that since you do a lot of financial companies? I think in particular we do and take a very active role, but we try to do it with a gender blind viewpoint. Uh, we try to bring, in a way, the qualifications of what individuals will bring to get them interested in what that individual encompasses as far as a skill set, and then we can be more revealing later on. Now, it's oftentimes even easier in China where the names do not necessarily reflect the gender. <laughs> That's interesting. Yes, yes, indeed. Hi, Angelina Kwan from Reorient Financial Markets. Um, a question for the whole panel. We've been talking about the really interesting aspects of being a board director and maybe some of our impetus in doing so. But could the panel tell also some of the responsibilities of being a board director, as well as um, looking at director's liability insurance, as well as what is the typical pay for, um, no, because it, it should be actually discussed so that people know the responsibilities. So if the panel could um, actually discuss that, and, and in particular, Catherine, your responsibilities, how much time does it take you? Because you're running a bank on top of it and you have to juggle your responsibilities. All right, very um, quickly, the time and Catherine, aspects. On, on the time management Thank question, you. and um, the other three of you, if you'd briefly address the pay, you know, for what size company, very briefly, because I want to get as much, many questions in as possible. So, Catherine, please. Um, two things is, uh, what's the responsibility? I, I, I would also like to address this one. It's a very important one, actually. Boards in Hong Kong mainly is four times a year, right? And uh, overseas, in European boards between um, six to eight or six to nine, and uh, in the US is about uh, five to six a year. Whatever it is, 
is still very limited number. So every meeting, you really need to be very well prepared. Otherwise, you know, it's a wasted opportunity for you to contribute. And more importantly, people can't see you, can't feel you. So in order to prepare yourself, you, in order to contribute, you really need to prepare yourself and, um, and read, the, read those documents. And I, 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 I must confess, I wasn't a very good, uh, uh, I wasn't a very good, uh, you know, detail writing uh, reader. And I, and I don't really, other than magazines, I'm not that keen about fictions, about books. And now with all these boards, I have to deal with this kind of stack all the time. So it's a discipline. You really need to get yourself into it. And once you get into it, it's fine. In terms of time, I talked about those, uh, those uh, a number of times that you meet, the preparation for it. I, I think just reading those, you have to allocate at least one day, at least one day, and then prepare yourself for those uh, questionings. And also, more importantly, is that you always need to be on the, on the lookout of information relating to the company, re relating to the industry that your company is in. So those, uh, for example, bow steel in China, I, I will need to constantly on the lookout for information about iron ore prices uh, on the mining industries in the world, about those supplier, key suppliers to them, about their competitors, about China's economy. So it's just this, this wide-ranging subjects that are related, crucial to the industry uh, that Bao Steel is in. So these are the these are some of the responsibilities that you need to be prepared for. Yes, it is uh, time juggling. That's why, you know, I, I want to urge you once you onto uh, board commitments, you really you really need to be a much better time planner. Um, otherwise, it could easily eat into eat into you. You don't know to what extent that enough is enough about you know what how you prepare yourself for the for the company board. And I suppose that's just when the companies are running smoothly. I mean, if I <laughs> added up how many boards you've got and how much just reading, regular reading, you've got 15 days of work just reading a year. And then if something goes wrong with the companies, you're on call, right? I mean, take uh, any of the banks in the 2008 price prices. I'm sure that the boards were on the phone meeting all the time. That's, you know, that's when it really is necessary. Yeah, it's a, absolutely is the case. I, I, read about, I read about nine newspaper a day and on the wire and um, uh, on regular that's magazines is about um, <laughs> at least three and, uh, you know, really, yeah, you know, get, board get board into board some board of the board. subjects. Yeah. And um, it's a, a, <laughs> talking about boards, you know, when you screen, I, I screen out, I share with you, I screen out a very big, much bigger than my, 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 my uh, employer. And uh, it was a very attractive name. I went to the interview is, uh, with the chairman, you know, flew a long way and very excited. And, um, and it was very good, very, very lucky that I got an offer, and, you know, right there and after the interview. Uh, at that moment, I said I have to think about it, and I, I subsequently turned down. Is exactly is a, of course remain nameless is is the chairman. When I had the, it was very genteel, very nice looking, actually very handsome man, <laughs> and a very nice office, all all the all the right thing. So, but then, it's just kind of a a. a you, you need to, that's why I said you need to choose a board, you need to read about um, the, the, um, the person that you will be working with and whether you're prepared for this kind of, um, uh, for, for the kind of schedule that you will expect. Like, you know, if the person is a very hawkish person, the, the, the chairman or the CEO, then you'll be prepared for hostile bits, for M&A, and, and those will be round the clock uh, you know, particularly is on different time zones. So you need to prepare yourself. You, you need to really ask yourself, what are you going in for? But if you're going for excitement, you're prepared for it. Great. This is the kind of company that you will join. Very, very interesting. Okay, quick reality check. How much do boards pay uh, small, medium, and large boards? And do the companies take care of directors' insurance? Mm -hmm. 
So uh, Angela, you sit on a number of boards, so you will have a very good idea. I think it really varies um, depending on the size of the board, whether it's listed or it's a private company, whether it's global or it's just a country board. Um, we have seen at very bare minimum probably 40K to 50K US dollars. At the high end, 150K and above. The view is divided in terms of a, a director, director shares or options. Um, Half of people think that's completely conflict of interest. The other people think that will align board directors' interest with the company. So um, in terms of uh, director uh, insurance, DNO, it's almost a standard practice today. We would definitely advise our clients as well as the candidates to have that. Who pays for that? Uh, the, company. Uh, the company. Yeah, the board normally yeah. does, yeah. Um, yeah, pretty similar. The, the, the only thing I'd say is there is quite a big uh, difference between UK boards, for instance, and Asian boards. As I think they're probably the two ends of the spectrum. So a lot of Asian boards still don't pay as much um, as the Western boards, but UK boards particularly um, pay very, very well. Um, I think with the insurance is very important. I think US boards are quite um, uh, difficult with the Sarbanes-Oxley um, requirements. And uh, so US boards, frankly, a lot of people avoid them um, today because of the potential liability um, that goes with it. But um, Salary-wise, quite agree. Yeah. Uh, Forty to one hundred fifty for four to six meetings a year, plus all the plus knowing everything <laughs> about the company. Uh, well, it, it, it also depends if you sit on the audit committee, if you sit on the nomination committee, and so on. So you tend to get little increments and of pay for it, the extra duties that you you serve. And of course, the stock, the stock that you get or don't get. You know, I suppose mm -hmm. for jeans companies in particular, if you if you're sitting on a board of a company that's about to IPO, that. To that point, most of the, the board and or management positions that we work with are for equity stakes yep. more than anything. Right. Yep. Okay. Um, I want to take some more questions, but I first, I feel like we've heard a lot of happy talk on this table, particularly from the headhunters about how great this is and people want to hire you and there you are. And yet, just walking into the room today, I heard one horror story. There were three rules. The uh, person I ran into said that she went to meet with a young headhunter guy, maybe 30 years old, and um, was looking to serve on boards in Asia. And this is a very experienced, well-qualified person who's done the nonprofit thing and everything else. Anyway, she was told uh, bluntly that there are three rules for Hong Kong companies. You've got to be Chinese, you've got to be a man, you've got to be over 50. Thank you very much. See you later. <laughs> <laughs> so can I just have a quick show of hands? How many of you have had horror stories like that, where you're not finding that your experience is matching the reality that we hear from perhaps the more elite <laughs> headhunting firms. Right. <laughs> questions? <laughs> Further questions, please? <laughs> yes, ma'am. Um, we're, we're, um, we're hearing particularly from the headhunters, as you've just said, that the diversity and women on boards is, is good. So, Catherine, as you said, this isn't just a nicety thing. This isn't just a gender thing. This is actually a value thing. How do you convey to companies this quantitative value that women bring to boards? Especially, if I may say, most w of us women have spent our entire career pretending that it doesn't matter that we're women because we can do everything a man can do. Can I, yeah, can I answer that one? Um, I, I, I have personal experience of placing women on a board for the first time. And I think that, that uh, you know, what, what women bring to boards and what I tell chairman about is, is that women bring, women are not frightened to challenge the status quo. Men tend to be quite clubby on the board. They tend to sort of want to fit in and be part of the team. Women are able to challenge the status quo. But more importantly, what women do is they do it in a non-confrontational way. It doesn't matter how hard men try, how many clever words and how they go round and round the beat around the bushes, it always sounds confrontational when they disagree with the status quo. And women have the ability to do that. And I can remember sitting on the board for the first time, and we had two women on the board, and I can remember one of them said something, and we all were sort of chatting away, and we suddenly looked at each other and said, did she really say that? <laughs> How does she get away with it, you know? But it was great. And I think that's what I try and tell chairman now, is say, look, you know, that's what you're going to get on a board. That's what women bring to the board. But I do think there is one other quite interesting thing, and, and, and I, I don't like the terminology. I've invented it myself, but I'm afraid I'm, I'm going to use it. Um, the, the, the problem we do see is there, there are 
quite a few alpha females around. And most of them, fortunately, are of an older generation because they've had to fight men and be like men to beat them and to get up to the top. Um, alpha females are actually not great for reputation of women on boards. And the main reason is not so much that they're not good, because they are generally very, very good, because they've had to be good to get to where they've got to. But they don't champion women's cause on boards. They, they, they don't fly the flag or the banner. And I think that's the saddest factor, is that these women say, as I, I see myself as genderless when it comes to business, and they have no interest. I mean, Margaret Thatcher never appointed a single woman on her cabinet or into a government, classic alpha female. And so what, what I'm, I'm really encouraged to see is, is people in the room looking around the people in the room. I don't sense there are too many alpha females here. And uh, that's a very, very good thing for me. I don't know. I bet there are. <laughs> <laughs> you know, in any room of accomplished women. Anyway, I know we have a question here. Thank you. Um, the Robert, the term in Australia, sorry, Fiona Shand from Australia. <laughs> uh, the term in Australia for your alpha females is blokes with lipstick. <laughs> um, it's been developed. Um, I wouldn't get away with saying that, you see. That's, that, that would become exactly. confrontational, you know. <laughs> um, so we do have them in Australia as well. They're, they're a phenomenon all around the world. Um, the, the economic data has, sorry, the, the data that has been produced, particularly by Catalyst and McKinsey's, have actually proved that, and it's printed for the last three years, that return on equity 17% higher in boards with three or more, and you're looking Fantastic. surprised at this, which frightens me. <laughs> um, I can lend you the book afterwards um, that produces that data from McKinsey and Catalyst. Uh, the data also provides that you need three or more senior decision makers or board members. So senior management two, one on the board, or vice versa. Uh, we have some companies uh, that around the world have just adopted a uh, puff of oestrogen approach for their boards. Uh, we'll put one woman on there because that ticks that box. What advice would you give to aspirant female board directors in terms of reviewing the actual gender view of the company and the board before they take up that position to avoid the puff of oestrogen and to actually get a three or more critical mass in the senior decision making process, which the data tells us. So how do you know if the rest of the people that you're going to be serving with on the board are people you want to sit around the table with a lot of time? Um, Jean or Catherine, would you like to talk about that? I think, Fiona, it's a very interesting question, and, and it's also related to the question before. Uh, what I find is that we're not only going to have to convince chairman and CEOs the merit of having a female board member, we have to convince the rest of the board of directors. I'm actually going through a case right now, working with a, a UK-based major board, um, and we're putting forward a very strong Asian, actually Chinese female candidate. The chairman and the CEO love the candidate. Our next round, uh, next week, is actually to go through three independent director interviews with our candidate. The idea here is, to be on the board, it's not only the contribution you can you can bring to the table from your business experience, it's how you're going to relate to the rest of the board of directors. They could be different generation, they're all male, so to be the first female, it is a, a huge challenge and takes a lot of courage to do it. But I think it's also, it would take time. It's not, the rest of the board is not going to change overnight their behaviors just because they have the first female uh, director. So um, I think the way we are working through with this female candidate is really to, ha to ask her to think through, beyond her business experience, what else she can bring to the table and contribute to the rest of the, uh, relate to the rest of the, uh, the member. Only by doing so, she can be effective and be influential. Do you mean something as simple as playing golf or go liking <laughs> the same kind of you know, whiskey or whatever? Um, it's, it's not, so yeah, the question of that did come up. Uh, do I need to play golf or, or do I have to go to the same place they have vacation, like southern France? Right, how do I have uh, time for this? Uh, do I have time for that? Uh, I would have a very busy executive job. I, I think actually it's, it's, it's probably simpler than that. Um, as a very successful executive, um, you will serve clients and you will serve clients of all or gender and, and age groups. So just think about how you relate to a client. 
and that's how you're going to relate to the, the rest of the board. So once we talk about that, I think we put that candidate much at ease. She said, I relate to the chairman and see your client extremely well. Um, so I can do the same with the rest of the board. There's a part of the story and from your background you can bring to the table what fascinates these people. And at the end of the day, it's that personal connection make you really effective on that board. Very interesting. Yeah, I'd have to say the whole is the sum of its parts. And if you take a look at each component part and the interactivity that they have with their management teams and who they surround themselves with, a la Robbie's comment about Margaret Thatcher, um, if you gain that degree of knowledge and that due diligence, it will give you some idea of how they'll interrelate within the context of the board itself. Very interesting. Other questions from the audience? Yes, please. My question relates to um, two items. One is, how do we get to hear about these board appointments, whether they are in NGO land or within the corporate world or indeed elsewhere within education, for example? And then secondly, as all of you is involved um, with boards, are you finding that boards are increasing, increasingly mapping the diversity of their boards by age, by nationality, by linguistic ability, by background? Are they doing that in terms of transparency? Or is that something you are having to push? I'd be very interested in your perspective, both from a Hong Kong point of view and then also on a global basis, please. Thank you. Um, perhaps I start with um, the, the transparency uh, area of the question. Last week, there was a press release that the European Roundtable of Industrial Companies has, has announced the two significant initiatives to proactively promote female leaders. And, uh, What's going to happen is um, the 31 ERT companies will have a virtual database of female candidates. And those are the candidates both are in, the U in Europe today and globally. And they have appointed three search firms to work with them. And we are one of them. So they, they are actually uh, very much increased in, in transparency on who is available on the supply side. Um, in terms of demand, your other question, how do I find out you know, what's going on. I think the first part is probably, I think before I, if I, were, if I do that, excel in what I do. Then I will make my wish known to my network. Um, and because your network, your mentors, your um, seniors today are probably connected uh, more than you do in that circle. And of course, talking to us uh, will help. Um, I think increasingly, especially the UK boards and I think the US boards, we use, in fact, what I heard, the, the latest statistics is in the succession of, um, of non-executive directors in the UK, more than 90% of searches are not done through the search firms. Um, in Hong Kong, it's still very much through the network, the referrals. I have a, a, a place, the candidate recently, he's, uh, this is the male, uh, Hong Kong male, and he's on five boards. Uh, this is the sixth board he's going to be on. So I say, well, how do you get onto the last five boards? Uh, through my bankers, my lawyers, and my other board uh, board peers. So if you're a banker, you're a lawyer, then the chance is your peer group may also know, especially the pre-IPO pre companies that are looking for a board member. That's interesting. Yeah. Um, I think, again, it's, it's, it's this desire to go and seek out and, and go and get it, rather than sort of sitting back and expecting people to come and ask you to do it. Um, and the place to start, if you are at the start, is to um, go to your school, your children go to school, or your college alumni, and, and see if you can serve on, on or, or help or assist in some way that's gonna get you into a position where you're gonna be considered for a board place. And you can be very proactive and do that yourself. Um, one of the problems we have is, uh, uh, the, the headhunting firms, is that we are not an employment exchange. Um, we don't sort of, uh, you know, we, we do get appointed by people to go and find uh, members for the board. And so uh, it's, you can come and talk to us, and I mean, we're very happy to talk to you and tell you what's going on and who's hiring and what sort of areas, and we can help you with salaries and time expectations and duties and so on. Um, but at the end of the day, um, I think what Catherine said is very key. You've got to excel at what you're doing to be noticed, and then you've got to use your immediate network and try and get yourself up that first stage, a step of the ladder. 
Yeah, and talking about steps of the ladder, I think one of the easiest places to start is the, um, the, the educational institutions you've attended. And most of those board uh, memberships are elective, and they start with small steps. I started off with uh, a committee on diversity at my secondary school, and ultimately was the first Asian board member uh, elected at, in my secondary school. So I think that, again, it begins in small steps, but uh, the, again, spheres of influence within the context of that board of trustees was enormous. So. Very, very interesting. Um, I'll come to you in just one second, but I, I want to get this question in. Um, it seems to me we've heard a lot from the search firms about how you go and get on a board. You become a CEO, you know everybody in your industry, and it helps to be on some other board, even if it's a, you're a, you know, if it's a school board or something like that, and work your way up. But I wonder, Catherine, if you could give us your practical mm -hmm. advice. Assume that you're a mid-career woman who has decided, after hearing this panel discussion, that she actually wants to be on a board. Mm -hmm. What practical advice do you have for these women um, to think about what exactly it takes to get on a board? Mm. I could share some ex personal experience. My first external board was um, a, the headhunter got my uh, name through my ex-boss. So is, uh, I think is uh, is yeah. important that is, maybe I'm you know, one of those uh, typical female, I just, uh, you know, much more um, focus on what I do than uh, focusing on networking out. So I might not be a very good example uh, but uh, is is true luck is um, but uh, but um, I got the referral from uh, somebody that I worked with. So I think it's always much more certain place to start off with is to focus on our work, to focus on doing well, and uh, somehow. But then I think that part about um, uh, trying out with NGOs or trying out with school boards, a I, I think it's very good advice, but I, much more is that has to be genuine. It has to come from you, from inside, that you are interested to contribute, to reach out, to uh, participate in matters, in subjects, or in courses that are more than what you do for your day job. This is not everyone's uh, cup of tea. So you do, you, a, a, yes, it's very attractive to sit on a board, but then I think it's um, some so, so searching that we need to do because um, we women won't just take things for granted. One hoops, we are on it, we give almost everything that we have onto it. So it's important that you, you, you do some deep thinking. Is that what you want to do? Then you will definitely do well. I have every confidence that you will do well. But you know, think really if you want to do that. You know, you love PAC, so you can do SPCA. You know, if you if you uh, your, your your children's sports is is. But then it, once you, you get the hang of it of how it works in boards, I think that's what the search firms uh, colleagues are telling us is that get the hang of how it works in advisory boards. But I don't think that will be a challenge for you. The challenge will be adjusting the time. The challenge will be. Uh, testifying exactly what you want out of life, out of boards, you know, and, and, and just uh, putting things in place, then I, I think you'll be fine. Interesting. I, I know we've got time for just one more question. We have someone here who wanted to ask a question. Well, I'm not sure I wanted to ask a question. I wanted to make a kind of statement. Uh, I'm Elin Herbeness of the Professional Boards Forum. I work in Norway and I work in the UK. In Norway, we have quotas. In the UK, you have targets. All I can really say, I think you've, you've been given some very sound advice from, from your panel here. But it, at the end of the day, it's going to really be down to you. You're going to have to be prepared to do a lot of work yourselves if you think you're going to get onto a board. There may be, be people out there who will be prepared to help you and will say you'll help you, but in Norway, the successful women, even with quotas, did the work themselves. In the UK, I'm seeing exactly the same. And also in Australia, 
do not. I mean, by all means, do extracurriculum stuff and, you know, do more of the things you're already good at. But don't clutter up your day and your, and your CV so that there is no space and time left for when the real appointment shows up. So you can do it, but, you know, you have to think ahead and, and give yourself, I don't know, three to five year horizon. It's not like you're recruiting for an executive role. I think that's something that hasn't been touched upon. It's not gonna take you three months to get a, a board role. Very, very interesting. <laughs> all right, we've all heard great advice. I'm sorry we're out of time. Um, but I really wanna thank certainly all of the panelists. Yeah. It's been fantastic. <laughs> Thanks, of course, to all of you for coming, to Standard Chartered for sponsoring, and to the Women's Foundation for really directing this important, important discussion. Thanks, all. Very much, Mr. Ryan. On the other side of Ah. Oh, yes. No, I, I, I'm, I'm familiar with that. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.